Welcome to A Look Ahead. If you've been with us before, you know that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a series for the first three months of 2013. The series is entitled Origins, and this is lesson number eight, entitled Creation and Morality. Creation and morality? What do those things have to do with each other? And this is the lesson which many around the world will be studying for February 23 of 2013. But before we jump in, we would like you to grab your Bible, and we will bow our heads and ask the Lord to guide us in our discussion. Our kind and loving Father, it's a wonderful privilege to have your book before us and to understand, as we have this quarter so far, the many ways in which the creation events and the stories are linked to so much else in Scripture. Help us to understand now the role of morality that's suggested by the creation story. May we make it a part of our lives as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when we talk about morality, what are we talking about? Right and wrong. For many people, there will be another word basically for ethics, and that's a word that describes how people behave, right? We're talking about behaving rightly or behaving wrongly, right? So in this lesson, we will review the fact that God not only created everything, but he also continues to sustain it. So now, if God is keeping us alive, does he have the right um, to tell us what to do? Absolutely. He has the he, right. He, he allowed Job to suffer terrible reverses at the hand of the devil. But then he restored his health, wealth, and status and gave him a new set of children. Is that the way we would like to be treated? I like any, the, any takers? I like the latter part. <laughs> you like the latter part. Okay. Well, the, fir is. the first part wasn't too bad till the bad part came. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's just cut out the middle part. Okay. Was Job a better man afterward? He was a good man before. Yeah. Was he a better man afterward? Probably. I'm sure he was. No, he was perfect and upright in every way before, so how could he be better afterward? He was more perfect and more upright <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> more seasoned, yes. <laughs> well, here's the question. Do you think that, well, what do you think they learned from that experience? Who's they? Everybody involved. What do, you, what do we make of this verse? It's Job 22, verse 11. This is just a few verses from the end. Mm -hmm. All Job's brothers and sisters and former friends came to visit him and feasted with him in his house. They expressed their sympathy and comfort to him for all the troubles the Lord had brought on him. That's Job 42, 11. Yes, did I say? You said 22. Oh, I'm sorry, 42, 11, yes. Just a few verses from the end. Did any of them ever know about the events of chapter 1 and 2? We don't know. Whether they did or not, it got past his permissive will. Mm -hmm. And so there is a sense in which you have a right to say that the Lord was okay with that. Yeah. Okay. Well, God sends the sunshine and the rain on the good and the bad, it says in Matthew 5. He cares for even the little tiny plants, it says. So we shouldn't worry about his caring for us, right? unless you know about the story of Job, <laughs> once again. Well, does God take personal responsibility for us? What do you mean by taking care of us? And the well, we're going to talk about a number of ways, but the, go ahead. The reason I ask that is, um, you know, we've had a recent catastrophe in our mm -hmm. country here a couple of weeks ago in which, what was it, 28 innocent school children and At least we would assume they lost their innocent, uh, lost their lives. Um, you know, uh, there would be some people that would say, you know, where were their guardian angels? Mm -hmm. um, so, well, if how are we supposed to take this this passage that says, you know, consider the lilies of the field and mm -hmm. and the Lord takes care of all of that, so you don't need to worry about anything? How do you? That's a, that's a hard well, question, and I'll bet you there are some of those parents that are asking that, you know, right now. Yeah. However, 
Uh, I'm going I'm to take your question and turn it around a little bit. If Christians obviously were blessed way more than anybody else, so the people who were really Christians, they were all the rich ones, they were the ones who succeeded in everything, nothing ever happened to their homes, nothing ever happened to their families, nothing happened to their, their businesses, anything else like this, people would want to be Christian just because it was a way to get ahead. Well, Maybe but, God doesn't want that. Yeah, but, but, but that doesn't work. Well, I wonder why. So they would learn that right away. I've got to be a legitimate or a genuine Christian because but just wanting to be a Christian for these ulterior motives doesn't work. So it could be argued, well, that, then, then that would be better for those people because they'd learn they need to sober up and be the right kind of Christian. Wasn't Job the right kind of Christian? Well, but Job, <laughs> we, we understand Job's circumstance was, at least I think we generally do, is that that was... Um, a unique situation, yes, it was. In specific to him. We also Adventists uh, 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 conclude that that's a little bit of a parallel about the whole scope of things that's happening down here to all of us on this planet. But okay. but does that deny? Uh, I don't see why that is a special case, because when Jesus came down here to do what he did. He did all of it through suffering, through self-denial. And when we ask the question, where was God in, in that, like a shooting incident, we're not talking about religious things at that point. We're not talking about a life hereafter. We're talking about very temporal things down here and relationships that we're intimately involved in. But God is far more interested in can I get this person into heaven for eternity than make him wealthy down here? So then when we, when we read and understand these passages that God is going to take care of us, that doesn't mean here and now in our temporal and our day-to-day -day life. It's, he's, he, what he's working on is the eternal thing. What it means, he will be taking care in the best way that anybody possibly could to get us into eternity. Well, let me let me throw a Bible verse in. How do you do? What do you do with this? This is Philippians 4, verse 19, and I'm going to read Tony along with it. And with all his abundant wealth through Christ Jesus, my God will supply all your needs. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Because He's going to supply all your needs, right? All the needs to get you into heaven. Not all of your not, not all of your imaginary needs that you think <laughs> might have down here. I would, I would like to uh, mention that uh, Jesus was the Messiah, and uh, he suffered on the cross. He suffered insults. People spit on him. Prior to the cross, he was beaten all the time. They wanted to stone him. And his only message was love. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I personally believe, regardless of those children's uh, parents' faith, I believe that all of those children are in heaven, are, you know, going to be in heaven. And, uh, you know, these things happen. You know, they, they stoned Stephen. They, they crucified Peter upside down. So not to, not to borrow, you know, and on and on. All, all the disciples, John was boiled but, but didn't die. Uh, not to borrow a phrase from an old... Uh, country and western song but God didn't promise us a rose garden mm -hmm. and uh, so there's pain and suffering in this world and certainly that young man that committed those heinous crimes um, something possessed him there was something wrong with him and we certainly should not blame God for that at all mm -hmm. and God has those children and God loves those children and God loves all of us I think God even loves the kid that that did what he did. But that kid, he did it. He pulled the trigger. Yeah. Well, then what, what's the role of, of the famous verse that a lot of people quote in Romans 8, 28? We know then in all things, now this is the, my good news Bible, we know then in all things God works for good with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purpose. Now the King James will say all things work together for good. It's not the all things that work for good, it's God that works for good. In the, if you look at the earliest manuscripts, it's God who works for good. Do we believe that? Yes. That it's, long it's, pretty, it's, pre <laughs> it's pretty hard to 
try to wrap your mind around what God is working for and get that so that our heads are working around for the same thing. Mm -hmm. So often we get caught up in what's going on here and now mm -hmm. and we forget what he's really after mm -hmm. and what it takes to get there. Yeah, I mean, in what sense does it sustain us? It does it care for us to know that Jesus came down from his position in heaven. Think of all that he was up there condensed himself into the tiny little body of a baby boy, lived this, his time here on this earth, died that awful death, which was basically the death of a, the worst criminal, the worst thing that the Roman government could think of due to a criminal, mm -hmm. crucifixion, to demonstrate the truth about what? His character in government. How many people even understand that's why, what he was trying to do? But to demonstrate his character in government, that's, I, I believe that. But it, it was also to, to show the universe that humanity connected with divinity can overcome the devil. Yeah. And that's part of the demonstration. Well, another verse. We're, we're looking at scattered through the Bible verses that suggest how God relates to us, his creation and his sustaining. Look at Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For through him God created everything in heaven and on earth, the seen and the unseen things, including spiritual powers, lords, rulers, and authorities. Remember the Colossians believed in some kind of characters out there, and Paul says, whatever they are out there, God made them. <laughs> right? um, God created the whole universe through him and for him. Christ existed before all things, and in union with him, all things have their proper place. Does that imply that he's still responsible for them in some way? Well, he certainly took responsibility when he came down and did what he did. Okay. Well, it's interesting to notice that if he created everything, then presumably he also made the laws of physics and chemistry and biology and all the other laws that govern our lives day by day. Um, not, I'm not talking about the man-made laws mm -hmm. that keep our bodies running and functioning in consistent ways. Without that consistency, science wouldn't have anything to talk about. It would be impossible. To, if, right. God, if God hadn't made consistent rules for things to work by, I mean, what would happen if you planted a corn kernel today and tomorrow it comes up beans? I mean, there would be no... Everything would be chaos. Or it just didn't come up at all. Well, that's another possibility. <laughs> that may not be chaos. That may be some other reason. It would lead to chaos if nothing worked. Oh, if nothing worked, yeah. <laughs> well, some words from Ellen White. The Book of Education, page 132. The Apostle Paul, writing by the Holy Spirit, declares of Christ that all things have been created through him, and unto him, and he is before all things, and in the, him all things hold together. That's, of course, the revised version of Colossians 1, 16 to 17. The hand that sustains the worlds in space. Okay, why do our worlds stay where they are in space? Because God's keeping them there. Okay, and the scientists would tell you it's because? Inertia. Inertia and, and not, the gravitational sure. pull. The gravitational pull, all those laws. Which, which that we they know. don't know anything about. <laughs> they well, can tell you how it works, but why, they have yeah, no idea. That's true. So the hand that sustains, the hand that makes those laws work, sustains the worlds in space, the hand that holds in their orderly arrangement and tireless activity all things throughout the universe of God is the hand that was nailed to the cross for us. How does that make you feel? Pretty small. <laughs> well, our very lives are totally dependent upon God's constant activity. Let's look at some verses that talk about that. Look at Job 12, verse 10. It is God who directs the lives of his creatures. Everyone's life is in his power. Are you happy about that? Daniel 5, 23. You acted against the Lord. Now, this is 
Daniel speaking to the king. You acted against the Lord of heaven and brought in the cups and bowls taken from his temple. You, your noblemen, your wives, and your concubines drank wine out of them and praised God's made of silver, gold, of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Gods that cannot see or hear or that do not know anything. But you did not honor the Lord, uh, the God who determines whether you live or die and who controls everything you do. That's yeah, quite a sermon. That's quite a sermon, isn't it? Uh, what does it say about God's responsibilities? And then in the New Testament, go look at Paul's sermon to the Athenians. You know, Acts 17, look at verse, starting with verse 25. Nor does he need anything that we can supply by working for him, since it is he himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. You want to have life? You want to have breath? You want to have everything else? Where do you get it? From God. Is that, is that part of what we call the gospel? Is, yes. that, is that the gospel message? Part of is it? Is that part of the gospel message? So when one is preaching the gospel, one is taking the initiative to spread the gospel, that's part of the, that's part of the message. Mm -hmm. And if you drop down three verses, verse 28, Acts 17, 28, as someone has said, now Paul's quoting, in him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. Now Paul's quoting this, but he's saying this is the truth, even though somebody else said it first. He's quoting actually a pagan author. How do you feel about quoting pagan authors in scripture? Truth is truth. Truth is truth. And this one I like from Ellen White. Every pulsation of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. Now that's a picturesque way of putting things, but what, is that, what does that mean? What's that saying to us? Yeah, is that part of the, of the uh, gospel? It's certainly part of the first angel's message in Revelation. Mm -hmm. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment and come and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Mm -hmm. You belong to somebody else. But the fact that God made everything and sustains everything, that's not just a Genesis no. story. When, when, when you, you know, you, you, there's not a book in the Bible that does not address, address that. That's, you, cannot, you cannot take... Uh, the message that God did it and set that aside and then use the rest of the Bible. It's not that you can... If you want to take the, the, the creation and the sustaining power of God out of the Bible, you're not going to have much left. Well, let me read on. Ellen White goes on to say, He watches over us by day and under His wings we find shelter by night. His preserving care is over us whether we wake or sleep. He is as a sentinel to guard us from Satan's power or we should be taken captive by him. So who keeps us from being just totally captivated by Satan? God. Jesus is our constant friend. We are to look to him moment by moment and by looking to him we are to live. Review and Herald, December 2, 1890, paragraph 15. Okay, so... We've looked at a lot of references. Let's look at some, let's come to some conclusions here. God did not create our world or the universe and then leave it to its own fate as suggested by Deus. He didn't. We and, do not, and deism is, the concept of deism is? Deism is the idea that, yeah, God created our world. And it was, it was, deism was popular back in the days when they had no other explanation for where we, our universe could have come from. This is back before Darwin and back before you know, some of the other philosophers. So he said, well, God must have created it, but after he created it, he just like winding up a clock, he set it loose, and whatever happened after that's our fault, kind of thing. But deism didn't die with, before no. then. It, it's alive and well now. Among those who want to be part, ha have God, and have evolution at the same time. So they say, well, God started it, and then evolution took over. God went off on holiday. Well, yeah. yeah, he... Yeah. Bound up the spring, and he's been mm -hmm. absent ever since. Oh, really, it's, it's just a, a scientific or modern approach to deism, is what you're saying. Yeah, it's right. a modern. Same, exactly. same song, 
third verse, just a little. Absolutely. But the verses I've already read to you from Scripture and from Mel and White. Deny that completely. Yeah. We do not have any independent existence apart from God. Every heartbeat depends on His power. And I know that you already covered over this, but uh, I'd like to read it again. Acts 17, mm -hmm. verse 27. Okay. God did this so that men would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. Sure. So every, we're, God is controlling everything, but the issue is He wants to save us. Yeah. Every moment, the goal is to save us, to bring us to heaven, to shape our lives. He's he, the exact opposite of deism. Mm -hmm. So, true Bible believers, if you really believe Scripture, you cannot believe in deism. God existed before and independent of every part of His universe. It all depends upon Him. God and the universe are not one and the same, as suggested by pantheism, that's another ism, nor does God live in every part of the universe as if uh, the universe were sort of God's body, as in panentheism. We were created for and by Him, and He is the one who sustains our lives. And if you need another verse, look at 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Yet there is for us only one God, the Father, who is the creator of all things and for whom we live, and there is only one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. So, I don't know if you're going to accept the scriptures. That's pretty clear, I think. Um. If we had to go every morning to some particular person mm -hmm. and get today's existence, day after day after mm -hmm. day, I wonder if we would finally come to appreciate it and thank them for it. Good question. We don't have to do it just that often. We have to do it moment by moment. Moment by moment. That's right. Yeah. Every cellular mechanism that's working requires his. Yes, requires his. But it would be nice if if we kept that in front of our heads as often as we have to do it. Yeah. Well, God not not only created us in the beginning, but He also recreates us. Now, that's, is that is it more difficult to create something in the beginning, beginning or to recreate it? Uh, sometimes he would just tear the house down and start over. Yeah. He recreates us through the process of salvation to be in union with himself. And there's verses that talk about that, that 2 Corinthians 5.17 and Ephesians 2.10. And by the second creation, this second creation, he expects us to do the good works for which we were created. Is that unfair, unreasonable for God to say, okay, I made you to do this. Okay, I'm waiting. Well, you're going to have to define that a little bit. Um, okay. I said you're going to have to define that a little bit. Okay. Not me. Um, what do you want so, me to define? So, so I, I guess what I'm, what I'm, the thoughts going through my head here is that we were created to do good when, before the fall, we were created to do good works, but there wasn't any problem in doing good works. Yeah, it was natural. Right. But now that we are experiencing the, the effects of the fall, we're still expected to do good works. We just have to work at it a little more, I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, God is totally in charge of the universe, and He determines even whether we live or die, whether we breathe, how our heart works, all that kind of stuff. Is there any free choice left? Maybe we're just robots. No. We have the option of implementing Isaiah 27, 5. Okay, you want to read that? Isaiah 25 says, Let him take hold of my strength, okay. that he make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. We have the opportunity to take hold of his strength, okay. but that's a choice that we have to make. Well, and with... And yeah. Going back to Job, who yeah. we talked about, it was partly to preserve Job's free choice that, that all these things happened to him, to show that he had free choice. Okay. If he didn't have free choice, it was a very unfair thing that was done to him, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, without freedom and free choice, of course, there would, it would be impossible to love. 
In order to truly love, we must also be able to hate, or for that matter, to be apathetic. A God of love would never create a universe with creatures not capable of loving him back. You know the verses in 1 John 4, 8 and 16 that say, God is love. Uh, would that be intelligent creatures? Because yeah. dogs uh, or horses and mm -hmm. squids, <laughs> I don't know which uh, love experience they have. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you have a, a capacity to, uh, to learn, you have to have the capacity to choose, yeah. which, is, which is love. Well, but there's certainly evidence that, um, there's certainly some evidence that indicates some animals at least appear to yeah, love human beings. Um, and there are certainly, we would say they love their, they love their own, they love their offspring. There's evidence to indicate that when Certainly, in recent times, that when they when they lose, you know, an yeah. offspring, they mourn. There's some yeah. evidence that they mourn for that. They, I have. I patience. mean, it, it appears that way to us. That's what the yeah. only. Yeah. That's well, we the only it. conclusion you can draw. Elephants, yeah. hippopotamus. I, I have many. pictures of a game park in Africa, and a mother baboon carrying around a dead fetus. It was it was not even big enough to be born normally, and she's carrying it around. You know, taking care of it because that, that's her baby. You know, recently on PBS there was a, an interesting program about um, animals of different species helping other animals. There was a horse that went blind and this goat and this horse that had shared pasture and so forth, the, the goat started leading that horse around, mm. taking it to its favorite pastures and those kinds of things. And so... Humans aren't the only thing that are capable, it would appear to me, of, of love. A, lion, a lioness and a gazelle. The lioness was protecting the baby gazelle, and they became, you know, family. And uh, the lion would protect it from all the other predators. Yeah, amazing. Well, God, think of the things that God does provide for us. Um, food, nourishment from food. Everything we really need for happy existence. Animals were supposed to eat plants back in the beginning, while human beings were supposed to eat grains and nuts and fruits. And when God was done creating here on this earth, he, or this world, he declared everything to be very good. God not only provided a plethora of beautiful life-sustaining trees producing delicious fruit. I mean, why? I don't know if you've ever thought about it. Actually, you must have probably. But, you know... Were Adam and Eve ever hungry? <laughs> I mean, they must have had fruits of every imaginable kind hanging from the trees. Just all you got to do is reach out and take it. Every time they were hungry, that's what they did. But they, <laughs> I don't believe that they were ever famished hungry. No. no. Well, in the garden. God also provided that beautiful garden for him and intended that they live there forever in beautiful companionship with God himself. But God also created the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And they say, oh, wait, hold on, I thought that was Satan's tree. Satan doesn't even have the capacity to make his own tree. <laughs> it's true. Absolutely. <laughs> but God says, okay, you can, that tree will be your temporary domain. Um, By the way, that's the only place you can go. Right. Yeah, you can't be chasing Adam and Eve all around the garden. <laughs> right. This is your spot. Now, it's true that that was close to the tree of life. He didn't put it off in the remotest corner of the garden. So he gave Satan a fair ch chance, and obviously he took advantage of it. Um, was that tree there so that Adam and Eve could have a choice? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so they could demonstrate their choice. Satan didn't have a tree. There's no evidence that Satan had a tree, and he had a choice. So certainly Adam and Eve could yes. have had choice without just, you know, without a tree. The tree gave Satan a choice. He could tempt Adam and Eve, or he could leave them. And obviously he chose to tempt them. The tree was a more obvious choice than Satan had, than Lucifer had in heaven. Mm hmm 
And unfortunately, as we know, uh, the entrance of sin spoiled the whole thing. And the Garden of Eden was, what happened to the Garden of Eden? To it? Hmm? Deception. To it. Well, no, it's, it was taken to heaven. Where, how do you know that? Or, oh, what happened to it, you mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ellen White says that. Ellen White, Ellen says, White that. says that. Why, why was that? She why says that the Garden of Eden was taken to heaven at the time of the flood. And now I'm going to read you about what she says about the other end. I'm not going to read you that end. I could have. Why, why, why is that? Why, why is that necessary to do that? Well, well, I'm going to. I'm going to explain that to you right now. Well, hurry it up. At the end of, <laughs> <laughs> at the end of 1,000 years, Jesus, the King of Glory, descends from the holy city, clothed with <clears throat> brightness like the lightning. Now, this is talking about the third coming now, upon the Mount of Olives. Where did Jesus go up from? Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives. He comes back to the same spot, the same mount from whence he ascended after his resurrection. As his feet, as his feet touch the mountain, it parts asunder, Zechariah 14, 4, I believe, and becomes a very great plain and is prepared for the reception of the holy city and which is the paradise of God, the Garden of Eden, which was taken up after man's transgression. Now it descends with the city, more beautiful and gloriously adorned than when it was removed from the earth. And if you read on, she says, God preserved this garden so you could have a piece of it. Are you going to complain? So Adam gets to go back and train the very vines that he trained before his fall. Can you imagine that? Yes. Wow. That garden is still waiting time when we will live there. Extra tree going to be in there? Nope. No. Nope. Well, some people like to say nature is powerful. And Ellen White agrees. Signs of the Times, March 13, 1884. Nature is a power, but the God of nature is unlimited in power. He works in, he, he, his works interpret his character. Do we see that, obviously? Those who judge him from his handiworks and not from the suppositions of great men will see his presence in everything. So now we come down to you some know, of the... I don't, th I, don't think we, I don't think we see... I think it's there. I think everything, that, every tree, every bush, every shrub, every flower, I think there is something... I think there are lots of things in each one of those that tells us about the character of God. But we don't even, we don't even look for it in that, with that kind of a frame of reference. We... Yeah. We don't even know how to interpret it. We just use and throw away. Yeah, it, God has made himself available. This is I, I don't know if this is true, but I'm recently coming to this kind of a of a philosophy, I guess. I don't know it'll be a practice in my life, but I kind of think that just about everything around us tells us about God, but we don't we don't look at it. But well, how much of the loveliness and beauty of the Garden of Eden still exists in our world today? Well, I don't know if the sunsets were any prettier then than they are now. Yeah, considering how sunsets are made, maybe less so. <laughs> <laughs> through, through pollution and dust and, and other well, what about the, particulates What about the in orchids? The Could they really have been any more beautiful then than they are now? And there's probably more varieties now. Roses. Well, if you're going to allude to that passage from Ellen White where she says that the flowers and so forth are kind of wanderers mm -hmm. from that garden and left behind for us or something, then there is a little none of the left of that. But I, I don't know. I kind of think that those things. <clears throat> the Garden of Eden wasn't just the only place where there were flowers. No, but I'm saying that. Well, but the beautiful <clears throat> flowers. You you think that. You think outside the garden there were lots and lots of beautiful flowers? I kind of think so. Hmm. I, don't know that that, I don't know that, that the things in the garden weren't even yeah. more beautiful. Well, yeah, the interesting yeah. thing is, uh, you know, at my former home, the birds would often come over and they would, they would leave little presents and things. And suddenly a tree would start growing or some other flowers or something would grow. They would bring seeds. Yeah. And so I imagine that, uh, that, as was stated earlier, many of the flowers and whatnot did spread outside of the Garden of Eden. You were asking about 
plants and orchids now versus then. I don't know of any of the trees now that look like transparent silver and gold. No. So there must be some something better. Yes. Mm -hmm. But we can't deny the fact that a lot of evil can also be seen in our world. Oh. I don't think anybody's going to argue with that. There is so much pain and suffering, not only for humans, but also for animals because of floods, hurricanes, droughts, earthquakes, etc. I, I, I can never forget, get out of my mind, the time we drove through the Serengeti in Tanzania at, at the height of a drought, and there's just dead animals lying all over the place. Mm -hmm. I mean, just so, I mean, the, <coughs> the carnivores didn't even have to try to get a meal. I mean, and they, they couldn't eat them as fast as they were dying off. I mean, it was really sad, skin and bones. Well, the interesting thing is that these hurricanes, droughts, earthquakes, etc., what are they called? <laughs> Acts of God, many Acts people Acts of call God. Them. How do you feel about that? Well, the devastation is called an act of God. Mm -hmm. And then all the beautiful things, the regular folk, they call uh, Mother Nature. Yes. <laughs> Taking away from God both on both sides. What you can't control, they call an act of God. <coughs> and the salvation is the insurance company when it shows up. Yes. Well, we've already talked a little bit about the story of Job. Just about everything awful you can possibly imagine happened to Job. He, but in Job's case, he was a kind of pawn in the, in the great controversy. Something needed to be demonstrated, and it was. What was it that was demonstrated? Well, Satan directly challenged God's ability to correctly judge the character of people. God said Job was a righteous man, you know, Job 1, 8 and 2, 3, and Satan declared that that's impossible. Look at Job Four. I wish we had time to read the whole chapter, you would see. But it talks about a spirit coming to, um, what was his name? The first guy there? Eliphaz. Eliphaz, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. But you come down to verse 17. Can anyone, this is, this is the, 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 the spirit that spoke to Eliphaz at nighttime. Can anyone be righteous in the sight of God or be pure before his creator? God said what? Yes, and the Satan is trying to suggest, no, God does not trust his heavenly servants. He finds fault even with his angels. Do you think he will trust a creature of clay, a thing of dust that can be crushed like a moth? Some may be alive in the morning, but die unnoticed before evening comes. All that he has is taken away. He dies still lacking wisdom. So that was the devil's suggestion. And who was right? Well... God proved that he was a correct judge of righteousness. You remember Job 42, 8 and 9. Uh, I'm sorry, 7 and 8. That is sufficient reason for the book of Job, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, Job 42, 7, he said to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you do not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. In other words, you voiced the words of Satan himself. Right? Now take seven bulls and seven rams to Job and offer them as a sacrifice for yourselves. Job will pray for you and I will answer his prayers and not disgrace you as you deserve. You do not speak the truth about me as he did. Wow. I mean, how would you feel after God had said that about you? The real truth about Job's relationship with God can be seen and I would encourage those of you who maybe have some questions about the story of Job Look at Job 27, I'm sorry, 29 through 31. That's the real description of Job's relationship with God. But Job's story is very unusual. Very few of us will ever be asked to be a key player like Job and the great controversy between God and Satan. How many of us would continue to trust God under Job's circumstances? I hope many of us, but I, I doubt that many of us would survive. Most of us go merrily on sinning without even being pushed or tempted by Satan. And you remember the famous verses in James 1, starting with verse 13. If people are tempted by such trials, they must not say, this temptation comes from God. What did Job say? What did Satan say about God? This comes from God, right? For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. And we would say, well, no, it's, it's the devil that tempts them, right? 
Well, verse 14 and 15 say, but people are tempted when they are drawn away and trapped by their own evil desires. Then their evil desires conceive and give birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Who's responsible for most of our temptations? We are. How far back do you want to go? <laughs> We're personally responsible. Yeah, but but what he but the devil started a system out that yeah. we've been bought into, and without he that, to buy into it. That's true, but it's there because of him. Yeah. Yeah. And thus we have a redeemer. Yes. Exactly. Someone to pull us out of of our incorrect decisions. Right. But we're a victim of somebody else, but it is us that partakes in it. We decide, we choose. Right. But I then see. God can yeah. can save us from our own actions. As Seventh day Adventists, we are very, very privileged to have those five books written by Ellen White yeah. called The Conflict of the Ages series and, and an understanding of what we call the Great Controversy. It gives us a fairly clear picture of the overall results of evil and how Satan is involved, how God is involved. However, that doesn't always help us with the details of a particular disaster or a particular evil or a particular problem. And we think back to Job again. Did he ever find out about chapters 1 and 2 and the fact that Satan maybe was responsible for all that stuff that happened to him. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. However, I, I'm inclined to think that probably at some point in the future, if you read chapters 29 to 31 and you realize what a close relationship Job had with God before this whole thing started and how God blessed him afterwards, I have to believe that God came back and communicated with him later. And I think Job might have said, you know, something happened to me. Do you have anything to do with that? <laughs> and where did we get the story if it wasn't from Job? Yeah. Um, either God had to reveal the story miraculously to someone else, like Moses, mm -hmm. or Job had to know that information and transmit it verbally. Yeah. Well, Matthew 5, 45, I'm sure we're all familiar with, it says, so that you may be like, you may become the children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun to shine on good, bad and good people alike and gives rain to those who do good and to those who do evil. And that's an idea that came out right out of the Old Testament. Look at Psalm 55, correction, 65, verses 9 and 10. You show you care for the land by sending rain. You make it rich and fertile. You fill the streams with water. You provide the earth with crops. This is how you do it. You send abundant rain on the plowed fields and soak them with water. You soften the soil with showers and cause the young plants to grow. So where does all that sustenance come from? God. Yeah. If God were merely a human, he might be inclined to take it out on his enemies. He certainly could do that, couldn't he? But what we read in Scripture is that God sends his rain and sunshine on everybody. How does that fit with stories that we we often print in our magazines about how fires go around the crop, the fields of the Christians and so forth. Does that seem like a little bit of a conflict? It doesn't always no. go around those fields. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. The rain came before the fire came. I see. <laughs> the Christians aren't always saved from, the, right. from the gunmen. In fact, the suggestion is that down the line, Things may be give, become very difficult for Christians. Satan is going to come with his, all his fury, a la Revelation 13 and 14, and, he's, and, and 12, really, if you go back to 12, 13, and 14, and he's going to, his target is going to be what group? God's people. They're called the 144,000 in that section of Revelation, but it's God's true people. And he's going to do everything he possibly can to destroy them. If God... If, if, you, if, if the good Christians field um, can be hailed on, just like the guy next door who curses God every day, then what, isn't it a little presumptuous for a Christian to go out and say, Lord, there's a hail, looks like there's hail over there. Save my 
wheat. <laughs> what? What? We shouldn't ask I mean, God to do that. Well, yeah, because um, I don't know why, because not, but I mean, it just. Let your name be praised, Lord. Save my wheat. Let me tell the world about it. Though he slay me, still I will follow. I was going to ask a question. If we use that number, 144,000, is God going to demonstrate that he has 144,000 Job's? Well, there are some places that seem to suggest that. It certainly is true that she, Ellen White also says, we will stand individually and alone. So we won't be in a crowd of all 144,000 people standing around supporting each other. Well, does God use the, the natural forces of, of nature that we know about to do things he wants to accomplish sometimes? He used the wind to dry up the flood. He used the forces of nature to perform plagues on Egypt, a number of them. He, he, he blew quail in from the ocean or in from somewhere to feed the children of Israel when they were grouching and complaining. We know about wind. So these are places where God used natural forces to accomplish his, his purposes. Mm. Well, if, if all of those are part of what he made, mm -hmm. he's just using his own tools to do sure. what he needs. Sure. Which is fine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, there's a lot of scientists who, like the ones you talked about, they sort of want to hang on to God and science at the same time, and they think they're in conflict with each other, who want to explain everything. In fact, you, I'm sure you must all have seen movies made up of how natural forces caused all the miracles we read about in the Bible. Yeah. You've all read those or heard, seen that kind of stuff. Is that a, is that a valid statement it just happened at the right time everything and the right place, exactly uh, at the right and, uh, time in the right place but even right, to the right people but Sounds even like if you knew the ex <laughs> <laughs> even if you knew the exact reason the exact mechanism does that make it any less a miracle no i mean we get the idea that if we can explain it with natural with natural things that oh well god didn't have anything to do with it. that was natural Mm -hmm. I, I think that's faultier logic. So is that plausible deniability that it's a, a miracle if you have an understanding of the f mechanism? I think, they use, I think it's used that way, but I think that's faulty reasoning. Mm -hmm. Well, here, let me take you one that, that really sort of blows the scientists away. Do you remember the time when King Hezekiah was sick? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. And what happened? <sighs> this fable in the Bible. The wise, <laughs> the wise men in the east, a long ways away, noticed that the sun went back. <laughs> wow. How did, have, what would it take? Now, now, what is, I mean, we all know, our clocks and everything are determined by the regular smooth spinning of our earth. What does it take to put that back 10 degrees? Something massive. A lot of stuff that we can't understand. <laughs> and a lot of scientists would say that's impossible. That's just impossible. Polar shift, I don't know. Well, with things that we know, the things that we can touch and measure, and that it is impossible. But when you've got the creator of all of those rules and regulations saying, I've got some others that you don't know about, yeah. he, he could come up with anything. Well, it happened also back um, during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, that the day was prolonged, so well, the was, Israelites was, could, could win the battle. That was in the days of Joshua. Was it Joshua? Joshua was yeah. okay. fighting in the land of Canaan, yeah, for a whole day. Well, Abraham said it, is anything too hard for the Lord? Actually, it wasn't Abraham, it was God who said it to Abraham. He says, yes. my wife that longs past her menopause and so forth, and she's going to have a baby. And Abraham says, <laughs> excuse me, Lord. And God says, you aren't laughing, are you? <laughs> oh, so correct. You're right. I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and Sarah was laughing behind the curtain, and God says, you didn't laugh, did you? And she says, oh, yes. Oh, no, I didn't laugh. <laughs> and he said, yes, you did. 
and said, call, they called the baby laughter. laughter. That's what the main name Isaac means. It's hard to really get very upset about that. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Well, it seems natural for human beings to be worried. However, Jesus himself provided us with a very good antidote to that problem. You know, Matthew 6, 25 to 34, it just says, you know, God takes care of the flowers. He takes care of everything. And, and Solomon and all his very best finery wasn't even closed. Nothing like an ordinary orchid or a rose or something like this. So what are you worried about? I'm worried about the here and now, and I don't see it. <laughs> well... Something that is a little worrisome is that maybe probably largely as a result of human activity, we are losing species at an increasing rate. Species are dying out, disappearing. Um, is it still true that God is sustaining plants and animals just as he sustains us? And whole types of animals are disappearing. Dinosaurs disappeared a while back. Yeah. I think that's one of the things, though, that makes it hard on the evolutionary theory. Mm -hmm. Because the evolutionary theory says that things are getting better and they're getting more plentiful and we're going to have more variety. New varieties. Being new created. varieties. And, and that's not what we see when we yeah. look out there. Yeah. Well, in light of all this, in what sense is it true that if we put God first, he will take care of everything? That's Matthew 6, of course. In some cases, might answers not come until we are in God's kingdom. Well, let me tell you a little bit about a personal experience. There are those who want to put God in, in, in opposition to science. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we know that science is correct, right? So that means that if God is in conflict with science, he must be wrong, right? Well, many years ago, I entered Loma University School of Medicine. And the dean welcomed us by saying that half of what they would teach us was wrong. He just didn't know which half. And we know that. I mean, almost every day you hear someone announce a new study has come out on this particular disease or this, whatever, whatever, and what we thought before was wrong, and now we know this, right? Nothing changes faster than science. <laughs> but we think, we think seeing is believing, don't we? Does science ever prove anything? <coughs> it's beginning to be a little questionable, huh? Yeah. Yet men of science think that, now I'm taking some words from Ellen White again. Yet men of science think that they can comprehend the wisdom of God, that which he has done or can do. The idea largely prevails that he is restricted by his own laws. Men either deny or ignore his existence or think to explain everything, even the operation of his spirit upon the human heart. And they no longer reverence his name or fear his power. They do not believe in the supernatural, not understanding God's laws or his infinite power to work his will through them. As commonly used, the term laws of nature, in quotation marks, compromises what men, uh, I'm sorry, comprises what men have been able to discover with regard to the laws that govern the physical world. But how limited is their knowledge and how vast the field in which the Creator can work in harmony with his own laws and yet wholly beyond the comprehension of finite beings. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, Beautiful. page 114. God has all kinds of things out there going that we don't even know anything about. Well, it is true that more and more the phenomena that we see in nature are being explained by science, and let's give science some credit. They study nature, and they figure out what nature, how nature works. Of course, the laws that God made. There are still many things which science cannot, science cannot explain. Any Bible-believing Christian should recognize that no human being or even group of human beings will ever be able to fully understand all that God is capable of doing. Of course, if they could, they would be equal to God, wouldn't they? Sure. How many ways can you think of in which God uses natural law to accomplish his purposes? And what about all the natural laws, that is, laws that God has created to control the force of nature, but which, but which we do not yet understand? I mean, like we mentioned gravity. We can describe it by a law. It's very precise. and makes the world go around the sun. But how does it work? 
see Julie, Bono. <laughs> we don't have we don't have a clue. Speaking of gravity, if I may, here's a little miracle. Whichever side of the fence you're on, it's a miracle. If you're on the evolutionary side or or the God made everything side, uh, they say that the world is approximately I forget the numbers, you know, because they keep changing. 6.8, 7.2 billion years, more more than that. That means that this Earth has traveled around the Sun that many times, has maintained its orbit, mm -hmm. and has maintained its orbit in such a manner that life on this planet was able to continue going. That in itself is a miracle. Mm -hmm. If you're an evolutionist, you have to believe that that is a miracle. There must be a God. So thus, at least the evolutionists can come over to the camp of deist and then eventually make it all the way over to a full worship of the Lord. We, we just have a minute and a half or so to go. I'd like to review this and see if you think this gives us an indication of God's capacity to control nature. This is found in 1 Kings chapter 19, starting with verse 11. By the way, if you're interested in our materials, they're available on our website. It's called Theox, T-H-E-O-X, Dot org, and you can get the handouts which we use here. First Kings 19.11, go out and stand before me. This is Elijah, who had run away from Jezebel, was hiding on Mount Sinai, or later called Mount Horeb. And God was talking to him. He says, go out and stand before me on top of the mountain, the Lord said to him. Then the Lord passed by and sent a furious wind that split the hills and shattered the rocks. And what kind of a wind does it take to shatter rocks? But the Lord was not in the wind. Can God use the wind? The wind stopped blowing, and then there was an earthquake. Can God use earthquakes? But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, there was a fire, and Elijah must have said, Yes, I remember Mount Carmel. God's in that fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a soft whisper of a voice. And when Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. A voice said to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? Well, there's many pla more places we could turn to in, in, this, in this thing. Um, there's modern miracles. I, we could go on and on. But I think you get the idea. God is in control of nature. There's nothing outside of his control, including us. See you next week.